Thank you, all of you, for being here tonight. My great, great thanks to Deb Capel, Jewish Voice for Peace, not just for making this meeting possible, but for all their extraordinary work towards an inclusive peace and justice in the Middle East and beyond. And we are all grateful to Miren Ahmed and Awan for the Arts for hosting us. My principal sources for what I will say are declassified documents held by Britain's National Archives in Kew on the outskirts of London. All my sources are cited in this book uh, about how terrorism created modern Israel. I have also made available online a selection of these source documents. The web address for that is paldocs.net, P-A-L-D-O-C-S dot N-E-T. And this page also contains a link to book Arata. And for any of you that should read this book, uh, I encourage you to check the Arata. The list is short, but it's important. Well, our topic is, of course, the so-called conflict in Israel-Palestine, a tragedy that has dragged on for well over a century with no end in sight, despite its horrific ongoing human toll and its role in the destabilization of the Middle East and wider global fallout. We are told, we are told that the reason this conflict has defied resolution is that it is so complicated complicated or that is a cycle of, of violence that somehow self-perpetuates. My core premise, the reason that I feel I have any business taking your time here tonight, is to challenge this, to argue that this mindset is in fact one of the problems, that we have been conditioned to accept this tragedy as inevitable. It's not. I will argue that the conflict could end tomorrow if the international community wanted it to end. But it is being kept alive the same way all unjust wars are sold to us, by a narrative that replaces the truth. In this case, to the point of turning reality virtually upside down. If we poke our heads outside this bubble, suddenly we see that the conflict is not complicated. Indeed, we see that it is not a conflict in the proper sense at all. What is it? It's an ethnic nationalist settler movement, Zionism, that seeks to enforce an ethnically pure state on other people's land. The people resist. That's the conflict. But the word conflict is necessary. Why? It's necessary for the illusion of two sides negotiating and of a peace process. But this is delusional. There is no negotiating when one side holds all the power, all the weapons, all the clout, all the perks of statehood is blindly supported by the most powerful nations and to top it off when that side actually benefits from there not being any resolution while the other side has nothing nothing except a graveyard of unenforced UN resolutions and impotent international law so the question is what can we do to bring a just peace for everyone there against this overwhelming imbalance. <clears throat> Although the Palestinians are the obvious victims of Zionism, no amount of exposing the injustice against them will matter as long as they are reduced to lesser people who are believed to be ultimately to blame for all the violence, whether against Israelis or against themselves. But hidden by Israel's creation myth, by the Zionist narrative, is Zionism's parallel violence against Jews. Like its violence against the Palestinians, Zionism's anti-Jewish violence took two forms, physical violence and dehumanization, that is, racism. For both peoples, the physical violence was to force mass human migration, just as Palestinians could not be removed from their land except by violence against them, Zionism could not install a critical mass of Jews in their place without violence against Jews. For the Palestinians, this was outright ethnic cleansing and massacres, as well as starving them off the land by expropriating all means of livelihood. For Jews, Zionist violence was more camouflaged. Its principal forms were the blocking of any safe haven outside of Palestine, manufactured violence to force the uprooting of Jews living elsewhere in peace, and the indoctrination of Jewish DPs, displaced people, and children into Zionist messianic fundamentalism. But all this, obviously, is violence against civilians. 
to force a political goal, i.e. terrorism. That is to say, the Zionist project itself is by its very nature one of terrorism. There's no way around this. The only way you can force a population from its own land and replace it with a different population is by massive violence against civilians. Well, this is no good. Nobody's going to admit that what they're doing is terrorism. And it is as an antidote to this problem that Israel dehumanized both the Palestinians and Jews. One, it needed to spin its terrorism against the Palestinians, the obstacle to its settler state, as the opposite, as defense. To do this, it dehumanized the Palestinians into an eternal threat, irredeemably violent as a race. This de dehumanization has reached a level where an American president, and now an American vice president, actually speak of Israel and the Palestinians in biblical, apocalyptic terms. To quote G.W. Bush, he described Israel and the Palestinians as, quote, the ancient battle between good and evil. <laughs> this was to the Knesset. Secondly, Israel needed extraordinary impunity. It needed to be able to operate outside the norms of civilized nations. And it is to achieve this that it dehumanized Jews, the means to its settler state. It achieved near total impunity by dehumanizing Jews into the settler state itself. And if this sounds like an odd statement, I ask only that you not dismiss it out of hand. I submit that this, reducing Jews as a people into this ethnic nationalist political invention is the core of the entire tragic history. If I am correct, shining daylight on this is the conflict's Achilles heel. Israel is constantly reminding us that it is the Jewish state, not a Jewish state in the sense of a national faith that any nation might adopt. Rather, Israel's claim is something altogether different, something unique in the modern world. It acts as the very embodiment of Jews themselves, all Jews in a tribal sense, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their own perceived self-identity. It expropriates Jewish history, culture, and persecution, and all they symbolize back to the Jewish kingdoms cited in the Old Testament, of which it claims to be the rebirth in order to support the narrative that it is not a settler state. And it reinforces this by expropriating relevant archaeological artifacts as artifacts not just of an ancient Levantine people, but of the modern nation state's history. We are to accept that the nation state seated at the UN is that biblical kingdom, but 2,000 years ago, for reasons beyond its control, the pause button was pushed, and finally in 1948, Prophet Ben-Gurion pressed play and Israel resumed from where it left off. This messianic facade has enabled Zionism to sell itself in an allegedly post-colonial, post-conquest world. Every time that Israel refers to itself as the Jewish state, remind yourselves that it keeps millions of people in internment camps, more politely called refugee camps, in order to do so. Israel presents itself as interchangeable, interchangeable with Jews as a people. And the military advantage of this abuse is staggering, reducing Jewry itself to a human shield to empower the state's crimes. Condemnation of the state becomes condemnation of Jews, all Jews, simply because they are Jews, thus <coughs> making condemnation of Zionism and Israel anti-Semitic by definition. If we accept that Jews as a people equal Israel, then Jews are committing the nation state's crimes. Israel cannot have it both ways. Thus, Zionism, if we accept it, if we accept it, succeeds where all the bigots through the centuries never could. Traditional anti-Semitism can only attack externally. Despite all its murder, all its horrors, all its desecration, traditional anti-Semitism is powerless to lessen the integrity of Jews or Judaism. Zionism, if we accept it, does. If we accept Zionism, if we accept Israel at its word, then we have corrupted Jewry itself from within. And so the oft-heard question, 
does anti-Zionism necessarily equal anti-Semitism is backwards. The question should be, is Zionism necessarily anti-Semitic? Anti-Semitism was, of course, the alleged rationale for Zionism's beginnings in the late 19th century. And although many Jews at the time saw Zionism as a betrayal of the long struggle for equality, refuge from anti-Semitism was certainly the sincere motivation of many of Zionism's early followers. But by the time of the Balfour Declaration 101 years ago, there is no longer any ambiguity. For Zionism's leaders, the settler ethnocracy itself had already become the actual goal. <coughs> Anti-Semitism and persecuted Jews had become the means to that goal. What is irrefutable in British source documents from the time is that Balfour and the other officials involved knew, knew in 1917, knew all along, that the Zionists intended to seize all of Palestine and ethnically cleanse it of non-Jews. That was always the plan, it remained the plan throughout the mandate years, and it of course remains the plan today. Propaganda for public consumption aside, there was never any intention of living at peace and as equals with the land's native people. Behind the scenes, activists like Hein Weizmann were demanding the entire region for a Zionist state, including Jordan. Treated the ethnic cleansing of non-Jewish Palestinians as indispensable to their plans and insisted that the British lie about the scheme until it is too late for anyone to do anything about it. In correspondence with Balfour, Weizmann, who would become Israel's first president, justified his lies with racist slurs against the Palestinians and against Jews, that is, non-Zionist Jews, and in particular, the Middle East indigenous Jews who were overwhelmingly opposed to Zionism and who Weizmann smeared with classic anti-Semitic stereotypes. The Palestinians, well, the Palestinians he dismissed as, in, in so many words, a lower type of human. And this was among the reasons he and other Zionist leaders used for refusing simple democracy in Palestine. If the Arabs, the Palestinians, had the vote, he said, it would lower the Jew down to the level of a native, his word. By the 1920s, four decades of Palestinian protest against their dispossession of land, labor, and resources had proved futile, and the late 1920s brought the first of two Palestinian uprisings. Palestinian terrorists were loosely knit groups operating outside the Palestinian villages. In contrast, Zionist terror organizations operated from within the settlements and were actively empowered and shielded by those settlements and by the Jewish agency the recognized semi-autonomous ruling body of the settlements, what would become the Israeli government in 1948. And whereas the Palestinian villages did help to some extent in ending Palestinian terror, the Zionist settlements were party to the terrorism, shielded and funded the terrorists, and steadfastly refused any cooperation in stopping the terror. Now, there were, of course, many among the Jewish settlements who were horrified at the terrorism, but if they became vocal, they would, for example, find their cars blown up, while those who became more actively opposed were not so lucky. Three major terror organizations dominated Palestine during these years and attacked anyone in their way, Palestinian, Jew, or British. The Haganah, formed in 1920 and in large part trained by the British, was said to be a defensive militia though by 1924 it was already assassinating Jews simply for challenging Zionism. And the pretense that it was defensive would become unsustainable by the 1940s. Its offshoot, the Irgun, better known as, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, its offshoot, the Irgun, was formed in 1931 to engage in more indiscriminate terror, and the Irgun's offshoot, Lehi, better known as the Stern Gang after its first leader, was formed in 1940 by Irgun members who saw no difference between the Allied forces and the Axis powers, and therefore saw no reason to moderate their terror during World War II. The Haganah and the Irgun toned down their terror for a while during the war, but this was pragmatic. In late 1942, Irgun head and future Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin judged that an Allied victory 
contrary to what he had earlier thought, would not necessarily guarantee a Zionist state. And so halfway through the war, the Irgun abandoned restraint. And the, Irgun, the Haganah would soon follow suit as part of a military calculation. The Jewish agency often cooperated and collaborated with the Irgun and Lehi and even helped finance the Irgun. It would condemn Irgun and Lehi terror, but this was almost always cosmetic. With rare exception, it steadfastly refused any help in ending it. The common British analysis, which I think the evidence abundantly supports, was that the Haganah would let the Irgun in particular carry out terror attacks so that the Jewish agency could feign innocence. That Jewish children were indoctrinated and exploited was obvious at least as early as 1938, when the British caught the bomber of a bus filled with Palestinian villagers. She, the bomber, she was 12 years old, egged on by three adults. Jewish teenagers, both boys and girls, were commonly used to carry out terror attacks, and this continued throughout to the ethnic cleansing of 1948. Teachers were threatened or removed if they tried to intervene in the indoctrination of their students, and the students themselves were blocked from advancement if they resisted. Jews who opposed and tried to warn of the emerging Zionist fascism were assassinated, and indeed most victims of Zionist assassinations, that is, targeted individuals rather than, rather than indiscriminate terror, were Jews. Palestinian armed resistance ended before the outbreak of World War II. Through to late 1947, there were virtually no Palestinian attacks. As Zionist terror ravaged Palestine and brought the country to its knees, Palestinians maintained stoic nonviolence. A British explanation for the Palestinians' refusal to respond in kind it was that they understood, that the Palestinians understood that the attacks were a trap intended to elicit blowback that the Zionists would frame as a threat against they, which they would have to, quote unquote, defend themselves. This was the tactic that the Zionist militias successfully used to ignite the civil war of 1948 that the Jewish agency needed. And it, of course, remains Israel's core strategy today terrorize the Palestinians until there is a reaction, such as primitive rockets fired from Gaza or occupying soldiers attacked in the West Bank, and then use that reaction to justify further repression, further ethnic cleansing, and further atrocities. To be treated as most secret is the red ink heading of the transcript of a key meeting of 20 people, including the top Zionist leaders, held in London on the 9th of September, 1941, setting the direction for Palestine's future. I would like to summarize from this because it is typical of what went on behind the scenes, and it is an almost comical laying bare of the fraud of Zionist, now Israeli, claims of democracy and equal rights. Indeed, the conversation sounds like it anticipates George Orwell's then still to be written political satire, Animal Farm. Present were Weizmann, who had called the meeting, David Ben-Gurion, and other prominent Zionist leaders such as Simon Marx of Marx and Spencer, the uh, British department store, and the prominent non-Zionist industrialist, Robert Whaley Cohen. There is nothing left to the imagination. The takeover and ethnic cleansing of all of Palestine remained the plan. One of the speakers, Anthony Rothschild, began by stressing that there would be, quote, no discrimination against any group of its citizens in the proposed Jewish state. Weizmann and Ben-Gurion also assured the skeptics, Arabs, Palestinians, would have equal rights. However, however, they clarified that, well, within that absolute, absolute equality, Jewish settlers would have to have special privileges. And so Weizmann's, quote, absolute equality required the ethnic cleansing of most non-Jews while permitting, I quote him, a certain percentage of Arab and other elements, whatever other elements is he doesn't explain, to remain in his Jewish state, the insinuation being as a pool of cheap labor. Rothschild's vision of equality and non-discrimination was equally Orwellian. It, quote, 
depended on turning an Arab majority into a minority. And to achieve this, there would be, quote, no equal rights for non-Jews. Cohen, the industrialist, found the scheme terrifying. He submitted that the Zionists were, and I quote him, starting with the kind of age with which Hitler had started. He proposed instead that the state not be predicated on race, that it not be predicated on religion, and that it be named with a neutral geographic term. He proposed that the new state should be named Palestine. <laughs> the others were horrified at this idea, arguing that if the state did not have a Jewish name, quote, they would never get a Jewish majority acknowledging the use of messianic fundamentalism as a cynical political strategy for the settler state. In another obvious but never publicly spoken admission, Ben-Gurion clarified that his Jewish state was not based on Judaism. It was, rather, based on being a Jew in the tribal sense, which until Zionism had been classic anti-Semitism. Weizmann further proposed taking Transjordan along with Palestine and at the end of the meeting, he sought to put his proposals into effect officially in the name of all Jews worldwide. Those against his proposals were, in his word, anti-Semites. As they were discussing the occupation and ethnic cleansing of Palestine, a war was raging against occupation and ethnic cleansing, World War II. What was the Jewish agency's reaction to the most terrible enemy Jewry, indeed the most terrible enemy the world has ever known? From the beginning, it was not to encourage the Yishuv, the Jewish settlers, to enlist in the Allied struggle against the Nazis unless and until it was under circumstances that would further Zionism, which did not happen until the last year of the war with the so-called Jewish Brigade an inefficient encumbrance on the Allies whose purpose was to further Zionist goals. It was to conduct a theft ring of Allied weapons and munitions as if, well, to quote a British document, as if uh, the way this British military record put it, as if paid by Hitler himself. It was to continue its violence in Palestine, taking resources and personnel away from the war effort, it was to run a vast program of what were euphemistically called hiking parties or walking tours, surveillance operations throughout Palestine to gather meticulous, comprehensive data about the Palestinian villages and villagers they would erase when the opportunity came. And it was to exploit the Allies' war exhaustion to force Zionist goals. Ben-Gurion had long planned to exploit the Allies' end of war weakness and so, by 1944, the Haganah began ratcheting up its terror, even as the war still raged. Desperate, the British mounted a public plea to the issue, explaining that their terrorism was making a struggle against the Nazis all the more difficult. The plea was ignored and the terror increased. The explo exploitation of the war continued after the Allied victory when the Jewish agencies sought to exploit the fact that Britain's struggle against the Nazis had brought it to economic ruin. There was a move to pressure the United States not to approve its post-war loan to Britain unless Britain acceded to Zionist demands. Much has been written about the collaboration between the Zionists and the fascists during the war, the best known, of course, being the Havara Transfer Agreement that broke the anti-Nazi boycott. One of the least known was Leahy's attempted collaboration with the Italian fascists. In its nearly concluded Jerusalem Agreement of late 1940, Leahy offered to support a fascist victory in the war, in exchange for which the Italian fascists would use their military power to forcibly uproot Jewish communities and move their populations to Palestine. If this sounds like a scheme so extreme that only fanatical Lehi could have conjured it, it is essentially what the Israeli government ultimately succeeded at in the early 1950s, most catastrophically when it conducted a false flag terror campaign against Jews in Iraq to forcibly uproot that, that community and move its population to Israel as ethnic fodder. Many German Jewish immigrants to Palestine during the war were outraged 
by the Zionist exploitation of the Nazi horrors they had just fled. This outrage was given voice by, among others, the prominent journalist Robert Welch, who had been editor of a Berlin newspaper until that paper was banned by the Nazis in 1938. Welch warned that Zionist leaders, I quote him, have not yet understood that the enemy seeks the destruction of the Jews. We who have been here only a few years, we know what Nazism is. <laughs> Zionists rather are, quote, taking part in the crash of European Jewry only as spectators. Now I paraphrase, fighting the British and keeping Jews from joining the Allied struggle while getting comfortable and rich from their political project in Palestine. Recent immigrants from Germany and Central Europe, he said, have no representation among the Zionist ruling establishment. If they did, quote, we would have demanded that the Yishev should put itself at the disposal of Britain for the fight against Hitler and Nazism. But, and I am still quoting him, they do not want to fight against Hitler because his fascist methods are also theirs. They do not want our young men to join the forces, the Allied forces. Day after day, they are sabotaging the English war effort. These German Jewish immigrants were shunned by the Zionists, their publications and presses bombed. Even kiosks, even kiosks were bombed by the Zionists for selling non-Hebrew papers to German Jewish immigrants. In 1943, a man whom British records describe as, quote, a Jew whose integrity is not open to question risked his life to warn about the threat of Zionism. For his safety, he was referred to only by the code name Z. Z described Zionism as a parallel movement to Nazism. He warned that the Zionist indoctrination of Jewish youth was producing a society of extremists who will use any method necessary to achieve Zionist goals. And he pointed out that as fascism in Europe has demonstrated, such a society is very difficult to undo once it has taken root. How trustworthy is this anonymous testimony? Well, I found at Britain's National Archives, I found a private letter in which Z is identified. He was J.S. Bentwich, the Senior Inspector of Jewish Schools in Palestine. A report by U.S. intelligence in the Middle East dated the 4th of June, 1943, described Zionism in Palestine as, quote, a type of nationalism, which in any other country would be stigmatized as retrograde Nazism, and stated that anti-Semitism was essential to it. Whereas assimilated Jews in Europe and America are noted for being stout opponents of racialism and discrimination, Zionism has spread the opposite mentality a spirit closely akin to Nazism. The report refuted Zionist propaganda about having, in so many words, made the desert bloom. It noted the irony that it was from the Palestinians that the settlers learned, among many other things, the cultivation of the Yaffa oranges. And whereas the Palestinians were self-sufficient, the Zionist settlements exist only on massive external financing. And should the settlements ever have to survive on their own merits, as the Palestinians do, quote, the venture will collapse like a pricked balloon. The conclusion of this early U.S. intelligence report was, however, naive, or at least premature. Now that the world, quote, has seen the lengths to which the Nazi creed has carried the nations, it reasoned that the Zionists, quote, are due to find themselves an anachronism. Uh, I'd like quickly to say that uh, all these Nazi Zionist parallels, which continued with the behavior of the early Israeli state, just to say that I don't make these parallels. Uh, I, I don't make them for reasons which, if, if anyone is interested, ask me at the end. I, I don't want to take the time now, but just to say that I myself don't make them, unless there's some specific historical reason. In general, most countries did not open their doors to the survivors of World War II as they should have, the United States among them. And this is cited as a principal reason why Zionists sought, uh, fought to increase Jewish immigration to Palestine. But this is, at the end of the day, this is a ruse. Most Zionist leaders did not want Jews to have any option but Palestine and thwarted safe haven elsewhere. 
the settler project needed them as facts on the ground. As but one example, in early 1944, U.S. President Roosevelt succeeded in principle in establishing a half million new homes for European DPs. More than half of these homes in the United States and Britain. U.S. Zionist leaders were outraged and sabotaged it. When Roosevelt's aide, Morris Ernst, confronted U.S. Zionist leaders in an attempt to save the program, he was, in his words, quote, thrown out of parlors and accused of treason. Why treason? Well, treason because Morris Ernst was Jewish and Zionism equals Jews. As Ernst bitterly put it, the offer of new homes in the United States endangered what he called the Zionists, quote, pet thesis, that being that Jews must go only to Palestine. Nor were those already settled safe. In 1946, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Palestine, Yitzhak Herzog, went to Europe to forcibly remove orphans of Jewish background from their adoptive European families. Removing 10,000 children from their homes was the number he cited to the New York Times as his goal. In the National Archives, I found a copy of his record of the trip. Uh, by the way, this is uh, among the records I have put online. Herzog complains of the fierce resistance he met from horrified local Jewish leaders who tried to protect the children, but he used his political clout to circumvent them. In France, for example, facing the steadfast refusal of the Jewish leaders to betray the children, Herzog said, I quote him, I demanded promulgation of a law which would oblige every family to declare the particulars of the children it houses. Now I paraphrase, so that those of Jewish background could be exposed and put back in camps awaiting shipment to Palestine. To me, this is a Kafkaesque twist on Passover for these children who had just been spared the Nazis. Herzog's justification, Herzog's justification for the kidnappings was that for a child of Jewish background to be raised in a non-Jewish home is, I quote him, much worse than physical murder. Yet even this bizarre justification fails to explain what was actually taking place because at the same time Herzog was rescuing Jewish children from this this fate much worse than physical murder, his Jewish agency colleagues were sabotaging Jewish adoptive homes in England for young survivors still in the camps. The real reason for all of it, of course, was that the children were needed to serve Zionism as facts on the ground. To that end, the Jewish agency had coerced President Truman to segregate Jewish DPs into Zionist-run camps, despite objections that it echoed Nazi behavior. The camps nurtured such fanaticism that it shocked a joint US-UK committee that visited them in 1946. Before these camps, the evidence is that few Jewish DPs wanted to go to Palestine. But now, now the committee found these DPs in a delirious state threatening mass suicide if they did not go to Palestine. Even the offer of new homes in the United States, which was made, and which had always been the favored destination, was now suddenly met with threats of mass suicide. DPs were also groomed in these camps to bring Zionist terrorism to Europe, bombing Allied trains and Allied facilities. The bombing of the British Embassy in Rome in 1946, for example, was with DPs brainwashed in these Zionist camps, as was a near catastrophe in the Austrian Alps in the summer of 1947, when DPs nearly blew an Allied train off a steep trestle into a deep abyss, which would almost certainly have sent its 200 civilians and Allied troops to their deaths. Behind closed doors, the Jewish agency discussed its obstacles. And what it considered obstacles in the 1940s says quite a lot about the present. These were democracy, the Atlantic Charter, which of course became the basis for the United Nations, Reconstruction was a source of worry, and the fall in anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism having always been Zionism's drug, without which it would be irrelevant. As an example, in Jerusalem in October of 1942, 
Ben-Gurion told Jewish agency leaders that although Hitler had made Jews suffer, he also, quote, revived and assimilated Jews the feeling of Jewish nationalism. And, he said, we have exploited this feeling in favor of Zionism. But democracy remained a threat. He warned that Zionism was losing favor because the democracies, quote, recognized the Jews as people having full rights of citizenship. And he blamed setbacks for Zionism on what he called America's, quote, democratic attitude. Another agency official agreed, condemning the democratic countries and their Atlantic Charter as enemies of Jewry. I also mentioned post-war reconstruction. To paraphrase from a British report, Zionist leaders were afraid that with the improvement of conditions in Europe, the pressure on Palestine would subside. By 1946, Zionist terrorism had become the defining daily challenge of life in Palestine, and 100,000 British troops proved unable to contain it. Anyone or anything that kept Palestine a functioning society was a target of the Zionists. Trains, roads, bridges, communications, oil facilities, and Coast Guard stations were constantly being bombed. Soldiers, utility workers, telephone repairmen, railway workers, bomb disposal personnel were murdered. Police, and especially Jewish police, were long a favored target of the Zionists and were gunned down by the dozens. Among the smaller terror organizations that popped up was one specifically dedicated to the Zionists' long-running fear of Jews befriending non-Jews, the ultimate fear, of course, uh, being polluting what for the Zionists was the pure Jewish race. As a sample of its methods, the terror group doused a disobedient Jewish girl with acid, blinding her in one eye. Zionist terror was aided by an intelligence network that included high-placed sympathetic U.S. officials, such that the British learned not even to trust direct messages to U.S. President Truman. When the U.N.'s Palestine Committee, UNSCA, visited Palestine in the summer of 1947, the agency had already replaced the committee members' drivers with spies had replaced the waiters at the main restaurant they frequented with spies, and most productively sent five young women to serve at what they called a theater network of house attendants at the building where the UNSCUP committee, all of the men, were being housed. The young men were required to be smart and educated, but above all, in the agency's word, they were required to be Daring. Whatever daring meant, they extracted a wealth of information from the key people who were deciding Palestine's future. Jewish sex workers were involuntarily recruited as spies. They were told that upon the Zionist victory, which they were assured was imminent, they would be executed for cavorting with the enemy, but might be spared if they cooperated as spies now. The practice was so widespread that a standard questionnaire was printed up that the women were to fill out after each British customer. Illustrative of the degree to which Zionist plants infiltrated the government and everyday life, a couple of months after one Coast Guard station was attacked and bombed by the Haganah, it blew up again, but this time the British were baffled because this time there had been no attack. It just blew up. They discovered that the construction crew that had rebuilt the station after the previous attack were Hakana and had simply embedded explosives in the reconstruction. But the worst <coughs> problem of infiltration was in the military service where deadly sabotage by Zionist plants who had joined the forces led, tragically, to orders to remove all Jews from service in Palestine because there was no way to tell them from the Zionists. By 1948, this problem spread to key medical personnel after the Jewish agency poisoned the water supply of Acre with typhoid in order to expedite the ethnic cleansing of this city that, of course, lies on the Palestinian side of partition, not the Israeli side. The bacteriologist hired by the British proved to be a Haganah plant or sympathizer, an obstacle to the availability of the vaccine. The exodus, the iconic Zionist immigrant story, was timed for UNSCUP's visit to Palestine in the summer of 1947. 
The British, posterity has it, sent the Exodus passengers back to their worst nightmare, Germany, destroying their last hope of a new life in their promised land. The reality, however, is that this was grand theater at their expense, cynical marketing for the Zionist cause. Yet again, the Jewish agency blocked opportunities of freedom and new lives for the survivors, in this case to manufacture sympathy victims. The possibility of new homes for the Exodus passengers in safe countries like Denmark was blocked by Ben-Gurion. The option of disembarking in southern France rather than going back to Germany, which all the passengers had the right to do, was blocked. When the British confronted Golda Meir, whose name was then Meyerson, when they confronted her about this abuse of the Jewish refugees, she refused to budge. The refugees would go back to Germany. To paraphrase Israeli professor Edith Zertal, the greater the suffering of these survivors of the Holocaust, the greater their political and media effectiveness for the Zionists. And bear in mind that the entire human cargo of the Exodus, 4,515 people, was less than 1% of President Roosevelt's resettlement plan that was sabotaged three years earlier. <clears throat> A few months after the exodus, in November 1947, the UN, violating its own charter, blocked Palestinian self-determination and recommended partition with the implicit, not explicit, but the implicit creation of a Zionist state. Resolution 181 and this implicit creation of the Zionist state was the direct capitulation to Zionist terrorism, the surrender to the certainty of that continuing terror against the West. Caving to that terrorism left the Palestinians as the sole victims of that continuing terrorism. The alternate UN plan was for a binational state, which the British believed the Palestinians would have reluctantly supported as a compromise to their desire, and absolute right, for a democratic state. But this compromise would be, to quote British documents, totally unacceptable to the Zionists, and quote, would therefore be followed by an intensification of Jewish terrorism. That is, yet greater terrorism over that which had already brought Palestine to its knees. The disproportionately large land area the UN gave the Zionists in Resolution 181 was also in fear of Zionist terrorism. Again, quoting British sources, giving the Zionists so much land up front was an attempt to delay, not prevent, but simply delay the Zionist expansionist wars that they knew would come. But this appeasement, of course, failed. Within a few months of Resolution 181, the Zionist militias were already waging their first expansionist war confiscating more than half of the Palestinian side of partition and massacring and depopulating hundreds of villages. But the fact that the British were occupying Palestine enabled Zionist leaders to juxtapose their terror campaign as a liberation movement against British colonizers. Finally, on the 15th of May, 1948, before there was any Arab resistance, Britain fled the scene of its crime for which the Palestinians have been paying ever since. British and US documents prove that both governments knew all along that the Zionist acceptance of Resolution 181 was a fraud. The Americans knew it, the British knew it, and most of all, the Palestinians knew it. And this, not just the Palestinian refu refusal to forfeit their right to self-determination, was why their negotiators could not agree to Resolution 181. The armistice that ended the 1948 war established a ceasefire line that, to quote from this, is not to be construed in any sense as a political or territorial boundary. Israel was supposed to return to the agreed partition, but it simply refused. Even if one accepts the legality of partition, the Israeli occupation of Palestinian land began then, not in 1967. We have today the sense that the situation calmed after 1948. This is false. The ethnic cleansing and now cross 
armistice line terrorism continued. Israel now holding up the untenable catastrophe it had created and refused to rectify as the threat against which it now had to defend itself. What changed pre versus post statehood is that the victims of Zionist terror no longer included Europeans. Israel's 1967 conquests and its ethnic cleansing of 300,000 more non-Jews in 1967 heightened its need for ever more settlers. And so, when in the 1980s, Jews were able to leave Russia and emigrate to the United States, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir, former bigwig of the terror gang Lehi, successfully coerced U.S. President Reagan to close U.S. doors to them. It is to assert this implicit ownership over all Jewry, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their own self-determination, that Israel refuses to allow Israeli nationality. By Israeli law, the nationality of Jewish citizens of Israel is Jewish, and repeated legal challenges to this abuse of Jews have all failed. Any acknowledgement that a Jewish individual might be free of an intrinsic connection to Israel would undermine its messianic pretense as the obligatory common destiny of Jews because they are Jews. Nationalism and what Zionist leaders would refer to as the Jewish race or tribe were made one and the same in the service of the settler state. It is consummate irony then that Zionism is now being flaunted as Jewish self-determination. We hear this all the time now. Zionism is Jewish self-determination, therefore to be against it is to be anti-Semitic. No, it is exactly the opposite. It is the hijacking, the hijacking of Jewish individual self-determination and self-identity. But, okay, here we are seven decades after the 1948 war and a century after Balfour. What happens next? How finally do we fix this instead of forever talking about it? How do we bring peace and justice for everyone there? Increasingly, it is clear that the only possible solution is what should have happened in 1948, a single democratic, secular state of equals. The good news is that, thanks to Israel, we're halfway there. <laughs> Israel, in its quest to finish its unfinished business of 1948, has not only discarded partition, which it did 70 years ago, but has also discarded the 1949 armistice line, essentially the so-called 67 borders, and made a single state. The two-state solution, if ever it was a good idea, and I don't think it was, was dead by 1949. And it grows ever more impossible as Israel builds a matrix of settlements, everything from outposts to veritable cities, complete with apartheid roads, the matrix designed specifically to prevent a Palestinian state. And the two-state solution would not fix the problem of apartheid within Israel, the most horrific aspect of which is the continued blocking of those it ethnically cleansed. But, Thanks to Israeli aggression, we have in reality a single state encompassing Israel, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights. A single state divided into various ghettos of apartheid and prison. Once we acknowledge that it is already a single state, who could possibly object to making everyone in it equal? What could possibly be the objection to that? <laughs> Earlier, I said that the conflict could end tomorrow if our own governments wanted it to end. And lest this claim still seem exaggerated, I ask you to imagine for a moment how the United States and the international community would react if the situation were exactly as it is, except that the ethnicities were reversed. If the ethnicities were reversed, the international community would rush their military to the region to stop what it now empowers and finances. It would suddenly demand an immediate end to race laws and the creation of a secular state, and the international community would jump to proclaim that equality 
obviously, obviously means the unqualified right of return. It would suddenly be self-evident that you can't ethnically cleanse people and then say that equality doesn't apply to them because they're not here. That would be a grotesque parody, and it has been a grotesque parody for 70 years. So, if all this makes sense, if ideas such as those I've described are constructive, what's the problem? Exposing the truth of the conflict should be a simple matter of the emperor's new clothes. Well, the problem is Zionism's kidnapping of Jewish identity as a military weapon. Every time the child points out that the emperor is naked, he or she is branded an anti-Semite and silenced. Now, to be sure, there is, of course, still true anti-Semitism in the world, as there are all forms of bigotry. But a particularly insidious form of anti-Semitism is this false smear, this use of Jewish identity to empower ethnic crimes. This Israeli military tactic of using Jews as a human shield for impunity needs to be called out for what it is, especially when it is institutionalized. For example, with the US State Department definition of anti-Semitism, uh, according to which pretty much everything I've said tonight is anti-Semitic. <laughs> and the definition Israel is pushing in Europe, both among governments and churches, the so-called IHRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance uh, definition, which by its very name exploits the memories of the Nazis' victims in order to empower new ethnic racial crimes. What greater betrayal of their memories we must do what Edwin Montague, a Jewish member of the British government, did a century ago. We must accuse our governments of anti-Semitism for colluding with the Zionists. The war against Palestine is ultimately our war, being carried out with our money, our political power, our weapons, and most of all, our moral capital. Ending it is our moral responsibility. Thank you. In your talk, you talk about the Zionist, and I'm wondering how you feel about were the imperialists from the United States using the Zionist, were the Zionists using the imperialist? What, in your estimation, um, did that look like? In the present or in the... Uh, when Israel was created in 48, the when the United States emerged as this superpower. Well, I, I, I think that the villain at the time was, of course, Truman, who cooperated uh, did the bidding for the Zionists because he thought, rightly or wrongly, but he did believe that it would help him get reelected, that it would help him get elected after uh, he assumed the presidency from uh, Roosevelt after Roosevelt died. Um, I think you have to go back to why the British got involved in 1917, because I think it's, it's all of the above. Uh, in 1917, there was, for both the British and for the United States, there was always the idea of having a foothold in the Middle East. There was always uh, a messianic aspect to it for, uh, for part of the Christian population. You see this. There was always a, a, the aspect of anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism has always been a friend to Zionism. They're, they're symbiotic. Uh, and I think this was a big issue at the, at the, it, it, uh, because Zionism needs anti-Semitism to have any meaning and uh, Zionism gives bigots a way to send Jews to a ghetto far away and feel good about it. That was part of it. The British government apparently, uh, I've read a lot of the uh, cabinet meetings at the time, the, the British believed that the Zionist leaders like, like Weizmann and Rothschild, that they had a lot of influence to gather the forces to help them in the war, in World War I. 
which was probably not true. But we do know that the that um, the, that Britain was was favoring the Zionists because of influence in the United States with the United States entry to the war. I think that was also part of it. Uh, there was always having a, a power in the Middle East, and especially when it came to Truman's time, worry about Russia, because who was going to fill in this void in that very important area? Why, at this point in time, why we are such slaves to the Israeli government is more difficult to answer. But I, th I think if you look at when we don't care what they do and when we do care what they do, what I think happens is that if it doesn't affect our interests, it's fine. Do whatever you want. We won't bother you. We'll, we'll, we'll um, veto the UN for you. We'll do whatever we want. We don't care. It doesn't bother us. But when it came, for, uh, for example, to to things where the United States leaders felt that they had an interest, for example, with, uh, the, with the nuclear treaty with Iran, things like this, then they will defy Israel. But when it comes to Palestine, it, it, they don't care, and it's easier just to let Israel do what it wants. Uh, in the back. <laughs> the gentleman in the back. What do you think accounts for the intensity of Zionism, which only has increased over these hundred years? Uh, uh, nothing about it has, has diminished. I mean, you've got to give Chaim Weitzman and all the people associated with him an enormous <laughs> amount of credit. If you want to study effective public relations, study the development of Zionism. Uh, well, what it wasn't just the Second World War. It seems to me that there was more to it than that. What, what do you think? I think that Zionism has created a society in which they're brought up with this. People are brought up with this. And there is, I believe, that many people in Israel actually believe that they're going to be wiped out if, if, um, if they don't do what they're doing. They actually believe this. In reading uh, a period I'm more familiar with than the present, if, if, if reading the documents from the early 50s, you see the British saying time and time again that they can't believe the level of control of, over the media, which of course is not so easy anymore, but in the 50s, the control over the media by the Israeli government to keep the people in this state of absolute hysteria, panic, that uh, that that they that whatever it is they're terrified. I I think that, and I think part of it, for some people, is that the idea of being a superior person, the idea of of some sort of uh, superiority, can be addictive. And when you grow up with it, I think that is also part of it. Uh, I read a quote. From, uh, from the 40s of one of my sources saying, it was um, Bentwich, the uh, inspector of Jewish schools, who said that we know from fascism in Europe that when once a society like this is set, it's very difficult to undo it. I think that's what we're living with now. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you said you would come back to at the end about the comparison between Nazism and Zionism. Mm -hmm. And um, my other like, super brief question has to do with the source material. Um, I know you mentioned that it came from the archives in, in um, England, but I'm wondering how you got wind of the archives and if, they, if you accessed them shortly after their declassification and kind of how you um, discovered them because I had never read about a lot of these materials before and I'm I don't know if they've been written about in other books or if you were able to kind of get your hands on declassified um, material kind of uh, quickly after it was declassified. Well, uh, in reverse order, the, the National Archives of Britain, I mean, this is a famous institution. This, this is a, it's a standard resource for researchers. Um, so that's, that, that was uh, the obvious place for me to go. The material that I used, some of it has been declassified for some years, for 10 or more years. Some of it was declassified just the past few years. I was able to get 
a bit more declassified uh, by my own request. Uh, but no, that's there for any, it's a fabulous institution for anybody who's researching anything that might have anything to do with England. Uh, if you're in London, uh, I, I think it's a great pay place and it's one of the few institutions of its type where you can bring your camera and take pictures of the documents. As regards Zionism and Nazism, well, one can make certain parallels and one can find other ways in which the, you can't really compare them. But the, my reason for not doing it is different. I, I object to the idea that we need to be jarred by the word Nazi and its reference to European suffering in order to acknowledge that generations of people in Palestine and the many refugee camps and within Israel itself have been robbed of normal lives so that a privileged race can rule over them. I don't see, why does it take this word for us to see what's in front of our eyes? Zionism has sought to reduce an entire population to subhumans. That is the reality. In the cause of Zionism, Gaza has been reduced to a laboratory for sadism and weapons proving. That's the truth right in front of our eyes. I don't see why we have to be jarred by, by, by thinking Nazi, oh, Nazi must be bad. No, we don't need that. We look at what's there, and it, on its own merits, should elicit the same reaction. Good question. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the Essex Exodus uh, and how it wasn't able to um, allow people to deport in any any country. You know, the U.S. and France and England was used that. The, the the Exodus went to uh, to Palestine, and as they knew what happened, the British. Uh, refused to let them uh, land. And the reason they didn't let them land is because th th the reason they were doing this was for uh, was to force the political issue. And uh, to force the political issue because, remember, we use the word immigration, but it wasn't immigration. It was the extranationalization of land, labor, and resources. It's not immigration. It was actually to force the political issue. So it was... It was the British, you're telling me, that didn't allow the people. I, that was not my question. My question has something to do with, with, with the, with, um, with what I think I understand you to say in your book that the Jewish agency would not allow people who were on boats to, uh, to enter certain ports. Uh, with southern, what happened? And, the, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So. And so if it was the Jewish agency who was instrumental in not allowing Jews to go any place else other than Palestine, was it also true of other, other boats like the, the, um, the SS, I think the Lewis, who was supposed to be, the St. Louis, the St. Louis, who, who, was, who was, the boat was supposed to deport to, to um, to Cuba and, the US. Cuba and the U.S., right. I didn't know the word, to deport, to, to embark, or to whatever, in Cuba. But what, who was in power? Who made that kind of decision? Who was putting the pressure on, on a Cuba? Like, it, made, it made it seem like Cuba made a deal. They weren't going to take the Jews because they weren't getting money, because it was money per head. Was it simply that, or it was the Jewish agency, or what was happening behind the scenes? With the, with the ship that you're referring to, I don't know. Okay. In terms of the exodus, the, 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 the passengers from the exodus were put on three ships for the return voyage. The three ships, when they docked off of southern France, they all technically had the right to leave. Right. And, but it was the Jewish agency that, that blocked them. Now, I should say that if you ever read the Wikipedia entry on the Exodus, you're going to read a different story. And it, it's, according to Wikipedia, they, they were free to leave, but there was some problem, or I forget what it says. And it cites a single secondary source for this information. I assure you that based on the source documents I've read, this explanation is not possible. 
uh, and if there was any smoking gun in this, it's the fact that the British were were trying to in, in, they had uh, encouraged the the um, passengers. You don't have to go back to Germany. You can get off here. And when they were literally blocked uh, for fear of, of violence, blocked from leaving, that's when they went to see Golda Meir. And Golda Meir's quote was, the best I remember, to, says, no Jew could tell another Jew to go any place but Palestine. In other words, you let them become settlers or we will make them go back to Germany. And there was, um, there was an active campaign to find new homes for the Exodus passengers in Denmark, which I mentioned, right. and that was blocked by Ben-Gurion. Uh, as the other point about whether Israel as a country could have survived without U.S. backing, I'd like just to add to that the fact that it, it has been demonstrated that the Israeli state would not have survived long had it not stolen all of the Palestinians' mm -hmm. belongings. Mm -hmm. the, the farms, the orchids, the machinery, the businesses, everything. Without having stolen Palestinian uh, livelihoods, without that, it would not have survived. It owes its existence to its theft of Palestine, of not just the land, but the things in it. What I, what I can say is that in 1948, after Truman pushed through partition, bullied the UN to push through partition, he immediately got cold feet about it. And there was this, this long uh, confidential exchange between Truman and the British, where Truman keeps pushing the British to to go back to the UN and to say, no, we're not going to use Resolution 181, we're going to abandon that, and we're going to wait until after the US presidential election, and then we're going to think of something different. And the British were having none of it. They were saying, as it is, we're getting blown up every day over there. And as it is, the, the, um, uh, the Zionists were putting full page ads in US papers threatening that the British were were lying that they were not really going to pull out. Uh, so for the, for the British to have changed this and stuck in there would have been a catastrophe. But, and finally, uh, by the spring of 48, Truman gave in and he, he, he put his, his weight behind partition again, uh, behind the, um, the dissolution of the mandate. There were also, in some of the more ex well, I think all across the board with the Zionists, but it was publicly spoken among the more extreme Zionists that the Marshall Plan was, uh, was considered to be anti-Zionist because it made Europe a better place. But there were, there were some of the more extreme Zionists in the U.S. were uh, saying that you could not be pro-Zionist and pro-Marshall at the same time. But just to add that, that there are hundreds of children in Palestinian jails. She happened to have caught the attention of the media. And uh, yes, of course, we should, do, we, should, we should support all of them. But just to always remember that she, has, she is simply symbolic of hundreds. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I'd like to also thank the co-sponsors. Um, Alwan for the Arts, St. Michael's Task Force on Israel-Palestine, Jews Say No, Tree of Life, the Universal Unitarian Universalists for Justice in the Middle East, the All Souls New York City chapter, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace Westchester, Jews for Palestinian Right of Return, and Brooklyn for Peace. Thank you.